Hello, greetings. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. My name is Ethan and I work with the Venice Church of Christ. We're disciples making disciples in Los Angeles and we want to be of service to you. We'd love for you to join us in our conversation that we're having today. Please uh, continue it in the comments. Please subscribe to us. And if we can be of any spiritual service to you, please reach out to us at VeniceChurchOfChrist.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Today, as we continue to consider the ways in which Jesus is our predestined offering, we'd like to consider another Jesus whose story is very much tied up with the events going on around the Passover in Jerusalem in the year 30. During the feast, we're told in Matthew 27, verse 15, the governor was accustomed to release one prisoner to the crowd, whomever they wanted. At that time, they had in custody a notorious prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. So there is Jesus Barabbas, who is destined for a Roman cross. He probably has associates that are also going to be crucified with him. If nothing else changes, he is going to be led to be killed that very day. And there is Jesus of Nazareth, who has now been brought up on trial, uh, being uh, claimed to be some kind of insurrectionist also against the Roman authority. What would be the choice that Israel was going to make? What does this have to do with our faith? This is a story that's told in all four Gospels. We read about it here in Matthew 27, it's in Mark 15, it's in Luke 23, and also in John 18. And it's a story that a lot of times we just pass over pretty quickly. Uh, there are some scholars who want to cast aspersions about the entire scenario entirely. But why is it here? Why are all the evangelists talking about it? What's really deeply going on behind the scenes that lead to this, the, the events that take place? And what can we gain from them? To begin with, it's good to understand who Barabbas is. We are told only things about Barabbas in these passages in Matthew 27, in Mark 15, in Luke 23, and in John 18. And he is described by the Greek word lestai. Lestai can refer to robbers. A lot of translations define Lestai as a robber. They call him a robber. And so it's given the impression to a lot of people that Barabbas is just some kind of common thief. Maybe got uh, messed up into something a little bit bigger than he was. And uh, this is why he's going to be uh, led up here. Uh, but you know, the Romans are going to try to make an example of him and uh, nothing much to write home about. Uh, that kind of analysis may be understandable, but is it true that he is just a robber? Now, in Luke chapter 23, when Luke tells us the story, we are told that he was a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. And that is a much more consistent story with the events going on here. See, if Barabbas were just a thief, even a thief who had killed somebody, uh, the Romans have very easy, efficient ways of dealing with guys like that. They could just stab him, and they could move on. Uh, why would he be destined for crucifixion? Well, insurrection would make it a very different story. And we can translate Lestai as an insurrectionist. And that's uh, probably the better way we are to look at that particular word and what Barabbas is. The Jewish people had been free before the Romans had arrived. They were a free people because around the year 167 BC, there was a Greek ruler named Atticus IV Epiphanes who had uh, banned the practice of the Jewish religion, made it uh, against the law to circumcise and observe the Sabbath and things. And there were Jewish people under the Maccabees who rose up in revolt against that Macedonian Seleucid authority and had succeeded. They had fought a bunch of insurgent battles and other battles and defeated many Greek armies and had brought a measure of independence to the historical land of greater Israel. The Romans were only brought in because two of those, their descendants were squabbling over the throne. And Pompey walks in in the year 63 BC, uh, establishes order in the Roman way, uh, puts one of those two on the throne, although he is now just a puppet for the Romans. And of course, infamously, Pompey then goes and defiles the temple, walks right into the Holy of Holies, and very famously, 
discovered that nothing was there. He did not do anything in there, but the damage was done. This was a defiling, shocking act, and it was a harbinger of the things to come. And so, over time, you'd have uh, the Herods ruling over Judea on behalf of the Romans. The Romans would have their own governors, like Pontius Pilate, that we're seeing here, ruling over the land. And the land was always in some state of flux. There was always those who were nourishing that hope of insurrection to overthrow the Romans, just like the, their ancestors had overthrown the Greeks. And the Romans were well acquainted with this, very well aware of this. This was their major headache and major concern about Judea. They were not about to let Judea go. It had very expensive uh, balsam being grown in it. It was part of the major trade routes up and down the eastern Mediterranean. It was too critical for the health of the empire, let alone its proximity Egypt, which was the granary of the empire and the means by which the empire was becoming extravagantly wealthy from all of the trade from further South in Africa and India. So there was absolutely no way the Romans were going to let that go. But at the same time, it was extremely hard for the Romans to keep peace because the people there did not want them to be there. And the biggest danger were these insurrectionists. Uh, there are stories of them in, in Second Temple Jewish literature. Uh, we find them uh, even in the New Testament uh, when Theudas is mentioned and also Judas is mentioned by Gamaliel in Acts chapter uh, 5. Both of those were guys claiming to be some kind of prophet, uh, leading up insurrections uh, against the Romans that the Romans had to put down. In Acts chapter uh, 22, Paul was confused with an Egyptian. And the Egyptian is somebody mentioned by Josephus as uh, a guy who claimed to be some kind of magician, was able to get 30,000 or so men uh, to try to come down upon the Mount of Olives to take Jerusalem, uh, but was defeated and was overthrown. So we have have all of these insurrectionists, uh, the zealots. Like, there was uh, Simon who was the zealot, one of Jesus' disciples. The zealots were those who were really looking for that insurrection, really looking for that violent overthrow of the Roman power. And a subset of them were called the Sicarii, the assassins. There would be guys who would decide, we're going to uh, assassinate a particular person, generally a Jewish person sympathizing with the Romans. And they would decide who they were going to target. They would all meet, find in public place, grab their uh, knives, stab them quickly, and all run off and disperse in the crowd. Uh, cause and great terror in the populations. This is always going on in the time when the Romans ruled over Judea and the Second Temple stood. Even when it seemed to be quiet, there was always that tension in the air. And then there were plenty of times where there would be uh, concerns about open revolt. And there were some times when the Romans were the provocators. Uh, what we saw about Pompey, Caligula decided he wanted to put a statue of himself in the temple. Uh, and then later, the last procurator, Florus, will actually take money out of the temple. And that was kind of the final straw that led to the uh, great first Jewish Roman War uh, that we'll discuss a little bit in a moment. So, crucifixion, which is a very awful, ugly way to die, was designed for guys like Barabbas. And that's exactly who the Romans want to make an example of. And he's exactly what the Romans are concerned about. And so, yes, he is an insurrectionist, and we should imagine that the two other guys who are going to be crucified that day uh, are perhaps his accomplices and associates in his work of insurrection. So, uh, now we are seeing what's going on here on this Passover day in the year 30 and the choice that is given to Israel. So here's the choice. You have Jesus of Nazareth, whom Pilate recognizes in the Gospels, is, is not really guilty of insurrection against Rome. That's the claim is why he's been brought up. Uh, yes, the Jewish people think he's committed blasphemy. The Romans don't care if Jesus has committed blasphemy against the Jewish God, but they are much more concerned if he goes about calling himself the king of the Jews if that means he's trying to rise up in revolt against Caesar. Now, Jesus has tried to explain to Pilate that his kingdom is not from this world. If it were, his disciples would be fighting. They're not fighting. And Pilate is convinced of that. He says there's nothing that he's done that's wrong. In Matthew's Gospel, uh, we're told that here, Pilate's wife had seen a dream and been terrified by a dream about Jesus, and therefore wanted her husband to have nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth. And so Pilate's trying to find a way to get 
out of the situation without touching Jesus of Nazareth. And so he offers the Jewish people, here's Jesus of Nazareth, who is called the Christ, the Messiah, the King. He has been going about doing good, healing people, but he is very much bad news for all the institutional authority at the time because he threatens the temple hierarchy, he threatens the Pharisees and their standing with the people because he uh, teaches the true way of God. He uh, is, is gathering a, a kingdom movement around himself. And so that movement will allow for them to overcome the real enemy, which is the evil one and the forces of sin and death which are enslaving them. They could choose that way and choose the way of the king that God had sent to them, the author of life. Or there's the way of the insurrectionist. We can't know much about Barabbas' motivations because he, you're not told much about him. If we want to think highly of him, that he's not just kind of a base thief who's just trying to exploit the situation for gain, that he ha nourishes the hope of his ancestors, the hope of the Maccabees, the hope to overthrow uh, with a zealous faith in Yahweh all of these pagans who are oppressing them and to be able to maybe reestablish and free an independent Jewish state where the people of God can again celebrate their God in peace and their temple and not have to deal with these pagan symbols and the pagan authority and everything else in their midst. That's the choice Israel is given to make. Are you going to choose the way of Jesus of Nazareth, the way God wants to recenter around him, or are you going to choose the way of insurrection, the way of fighting against Rome, just doing what uh, has always been going on? And that's the way of Barabbas. And of course we are told that uh, they wanted released for them Barabbas. And they asked what Pilate asked what they should do with Jesus, who was called the Christ, and they said, Crucify him. Crucify him. So Israel has made their choice. They have chosen to crucify Jesus of Nazareth, and they wanted Jesus Barabbas granted to them. But what would this mean? Well, Jesus says this happened while the wood is green in Luke 23. This is a time where there is as much peace as there is going to be between the Romans and the Jewish people. But what's going to happen in 40 years? In 66, as I said, uh, Flora, the, uh, uh, the um, procurator at the moment, takes money from the temple. The Jewish people rise in revolt, and they're able to successfully expel the Roman army from Jerusalem and to establish for a brief moment an independent state. But then Vespasian comes down with his army and starts t winning great victories in Galilee. Vespasian is then declared emperor because Nero the emperor was killed, and so now Vespasian has to go back and deal with that. While that's going on, there are all these different coalitions in Jerusalem, and you get more and more zealot uh, groups who take over and control. They start fighting amongst themselves. They destroy records. They destroy food. They're making a mess of the city, and the Romans aren't even doing anything to them at that point. The Romans come back with Vespasian now established as emperor. He sends his son Titus with the, the armies. They besiege Jerusalem. These Jewish people are doing all these things to themselves. The Romans let them do it. They, the Romans press their advantage. It gets so bad in Jerusalem that people are eating their children because there's no food to eat. You've got the most depraved conditions because of what happened. And the Romans would come in, the city would be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, Second Temple Judaism would be no more. They would rise in revolt again in the 130s under a believed Messiah, Simon Bar Kokhba, Bar Kokhba. And the Romans would come back in and again brutally suppress and kill many. And now they take Jerusalem and ban Jewish people from being in it. Establish it as Elia Capitolina and put a temple of Zeus there on the Temple Mount in what had been Jerusalem. There would be no independent Jewish state again until 1947. There still is no temple for uh, the Jewish people in that land. The rabbinic Judaism that would develop after this time was as different from uh, Second Temple Judaism as Christianity is. So you see that everything that Jesus had spoken was going to happen, because he knew this was going to happen. He had spoken all these things when he pred predicted condemnation in the temple, saying it would become a den of robbers. The same condemnation Jeremiah gave it. When he updated Isaiah's parable of the vineyard and said God was going to judge them for having killed the son, and in what is often called the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 1-36, in parallel passages, where he talks about how God was going to vindicate Jesus as the Son of Man through this visitation of judgment upon his people. And it came to pass. They chose the way of violence. As Peter put it so aptly in Acts chapter 3, they 
killed the author of life, and they asked for a murderer to be granted to them. And since they went with the way of the murderer, they went the way of violent, bloody uh, revolt, and it was brutally suppressed, and they suffered the consequences because they had rejected the king and the means of deliverance that God had established for them. And that's the really powerful argument about what we learn from Barabbas and the choice that Israel had. Because in our own way, we're always given that choice. We are always given the choice between the way of Jesus of Nazareth, the way of the suffering servant, the way that is the way that will lead to overcoming evil, overcoming sin and death, but by suffering, without responding in kind. Or there's the way of the world where might makes right and there's violence that is used against others and violence is used against you in turn. And the people of God are always tempted to try to do things in the way of Barabbas, the way of insurrection, the way of violence, the way where it seems right to them and it seems like this is what God should be about. And they can even find historical antecedents for why they think God would be about it. But in those ways is a rejection of the ways of the Messiah, the King that God has established for us. And why it's so important for us, when we are confronted with that choice, to not go the way of Barabbas, the way of the world, the way of violence, the way of insurrection, the way of rebellion, but the way of faithfulness in Jesus, to suffer evil without responding in kind, by being humble and doing good and continually submitting ourselves to the will of God in Jesus, that we may share in eternal life in Him through the resurrection. We hope that you choose that way of Jesus. We're so glad again that you've joined us. If there's any way we can be of service, please let us know at VentureToChrist.org. We'd love to hear your thoughts about Barabbas and Jesus and His way. Uh, please comment and subscribe to us where you found us. And may the Lord bless and keep you until we're able to meet again.